Okay, everybody, uh, there has been a tragedy in the world, uh, sadly, uh, another school shooting, and we're going to talk about that and some of the misperceptions about what technology can solve, what it can't solve, and then also how our kids are dying because there's some misinformation out there, Molly, about what's actually killing our kids, and it uh, has a lot to do uh, with the last couple of years we've been through. So I think it's an important discussion. It's a hard discussion, but I'm glad we had it. It is. And stay with us. We're going to we're going to cover a lot of ground here. We're going to do a lot of processing in real time and we're going to pull ourselves back from the brink occasionally. And I, I, I really encourage you. Everybody is just trying to understand uh, ourselves included. So roll yeah. with us through it. It's a it is a tough not conversation. Easy. It's not easy. Yeah. And we are trying to counter the hopelessness by talking about whatever solutions we can come up with at this point, you know? Yeah. And then yeah. we'll move on to uh, some startup news. Mental health startup uh, Cerebral is getting probed by the DOJ uh, because apparently it's very easy to get Xanax and Adderall um, through a telemedicine option that they have been providing. Yeah, an overcorrection to one of the many crises in this country. And then finally, just briefly, a breaking story. Jack Dorsey stepping down from Twitter's board. It's going to be a hell of a show. Let me put it that way. Yeah, it's a heck of a show. Yeah, stick a with heck us. of a show. Stick with us. Important show. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Coda. Coda is the all-in-one doc for teams. If you've got a stack of niche workflow tools or if you're buried in docs and spreadsheets, Coda is the doc that brings it all together. Startups can get a $1,000 credit at coda.io slash twist. Odoo. Odoo is a fully customizable and fully integrated suite of business apps that lets you build and scale your stack as you build and scale your business. Your first app is free forever. And right now, Odo is offering $1,000 off your first implementation pack at odoo.com slash twist. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash twist. And swag.com. Swag.com is the best place to buy, customize, and distribute custom gifts and promotional products. They work with some of the best brands like Yeti, North Face, Ember Mugs, and more. Visit swag.com slash twist and use code twist for 10% off your order. Hey, everybody, it's Wednesday. But it's a sad Wednesday. Uh, we had a school shooting again yesterday, 19 elementary school kids murdered, two adults murdered, so third and fourth graders uh, by an 18 year old with an AR 15. Couldn't have guessed that I guess uh, I don't even have to read the sentence to know it's going to be an AR 15 style weapon. Yeah, uh, with literal killing machines, um, which seem to be so freely available, uh, that one combined with one can only assume mental health issues. Uh, we get this incredibly toxic tragedy that keeps reoccurring here in the United States. This all happened in a small city in Texas. Uvalde, Uvalde, I believe is how it's Uvalde. pronounced. Uvalde, yeah. Uvalde. Yeah. Um, and this is unbelievably frustrating. I thought Steve Kerr, did you see Steve Kerr's uh, statement on Twitter uh, yeah. yesterday? Yeah. Instead of talking about the Warriors um, versus um, Dallas game, he said, I'm not going to talk about the game. I'm just going to talk about how frustrating it is that 90% of the country wants reasonable background checks for guns. I'm not talking about banning guns, just reasonable background checks. 90%. 90 percent nine zero and then we have i, I guess a 50 50 split in uh, the senate and 50 people on one side uh refuse to approve what i believe is called hb8 which is supposed to be a bar it's named a bipartisan bill so here we are why are we talking about this here well um because it's important to us as parents it's important to all of you and there's some technology here um that people are talking about technology is not going to uh solve this kind of problem it can reduce the number of deaths in children um there's been a lot of great work on all the different categories of ways kids die but i bring it up molly um uh, mm -hmm. because i know you and i care deeply about this because we have kids in yeah. schools yeah and uh you know every couple of years we go through this and i think it's important for us to have a discussion about it here there is no technology that's going to stop this from happening these weapons are so powerful that even if you had armed guards at the front of schools you know you would basically be involved in a shootout uh and best case you know 50 percent of the time we might be able to stop people if you know if it was a it was an even fight 50 50 a lot of times mm -hmm. candidly 
the police themselves are outgunned. They don't carry this level of armaments on their hip. Uh, yeah. You know, they tend to have them in trunks of every other car or something. Uh, but this is just absolutely um, mind bogglingly frustrating. And I think a dialogue needs to occur. Uh, that's it's important for all of us to have this dialogue it affects every American. Uh, we need to have this dialogue about not banning guns because we know that's not going to happen in this country, uh, given Second Amendment and how slowly the Constitution works. But like cannabis, like gay marriage, we should be able to have some correlation, <laughs> reasonable correlation between what the majority of what the country wants and what our representatives do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've, I've been on the back channel talking with affluent people, uh, you know, people with power and money. Um, status um about some fundraising around um just helping maybe get the republican party off of the nra uh, because it really is a money issue the nra which is kind of waning now i just had a ton of money previously to yeah. buy off these representatives yeah. um they're kind of waning now they've, they've got their own problems but we do need to have a path forward here um, oh yeah <laughs> we definitely and, do yeah. um i, I would this is going to feel like a little bit of a side note, but I would encourage everybody to read this Adam Gentleson book called Kill Switch. It's about the filibuster and it's about uh -huh. the history of the filibuster and how it has been used and how it was created. And it is incredibly enlightened, enlightening. And the book opens with uh, Gentleson himself was the chief of staff maybe for um not harry reed the guy who was the maybe it was harry reed and he the the book opens in the aftermath of the sandy hook shooting mm. and at a time and and these poll numbers remain the same when 70 or 80 percent of americans and up approved yeah. you know universal background checks and common sense restrictions on the availability of weapons like the ar-15 yeah. and and the the I mean, the Republican Party has been a wholly owned entity of the NRA for decades. That's just yeah. the simple fact. Yeah. And the filibuster works such that nobody even has to stand up and filibuster, right? They just sort of like signal, Not nobody has to put their name on it. They just mm -hmm. signal silently, we're going to filibuster this, and then mm -hmm. the bill dies. Mm -hmm. And so it opens with him in the office with Sandy Hook parents and Harry Reid, I think. I may have the name wrong. Um as this bill dies and there's not a thing that they can right. do about it. Not a thing. Yeah, so there's like, there are like, we're, we're literally turning to private fundraising and technology to solve a problem that really is like about the fact that we don't have a functioning government. There is some dysfunction in the government in very specific issues. It feels like some issues we do okay with, but my Lord, this polarization you know, whether it's Trump or social media or some combination of it or, but we, we do need to figure out a way to solve for, I don't know, pandemics, guns, I mean, right? immigration, yeah, uh, women's health, abortion. Like, right. Like maternal mortality, like education. Just small, yeah. Just a small cohort of things seem to really be. Yeah. Yeah. Clogging up the system. The HB8 summary, I don't, none of this seems to me, I, and I am a gun owner. Um, so I'll just put that out there. And I believe that people should have the right to own a gun. Um, I don't know if they should have the right to own certain types of guns mm -hmm. or unlimited guns or magazines, but I have personal safety issues, obviously. I'm mm -hmm. a high profile person and I am a trained, like trained by the, like literally a CIA person. I'm not anti gun. Uh, no. I was trained. I'm from Montana. Like You're I am from Montana. From Montana. Had, I do had, not want to. I was raised to believe that we shouldn't yeah. live in a country where only the cops have guns. Like fundamental. Right. Perfect. The, and so on. you're, I'm assuming you're not for an all out ban on guns, but gun control. Yeah. Some restrictions. I yep. think if, I, if I were to summarize. So there 100%. you are. You know, we're both, I guess, most people would say we're left leaning. Uh, maybe you further to the left than me. I might be considered more of a moderate. I don't know where you put yourself on the spectrum today. It's kind of hard to do now. I feel like it literally depends on the day. And also, yeah, like we're politically homeless because like, honestly, I look at, you know, where we are today. I look at all the failures to pass gun control legislation yeah. and I'm like, oh yeah, that was Democrats, right? Remember the Clinton years? Remember the like, yeah. 
And it, it was Democrats killing, not being willing to kill the filibuster, to be right. clear, right? There's like this one specific thing that they've allowed to break the Senate for 100 mm-hmm. years. But yeah, like, I am at the point now where I'm just like, am, am I just an anarchist? Like, yeah, it's hard to put yourself on a spectrum when they keep taking issues that we thought were on one side and throwing them to the other and abandoning certain things. And, and you know, it used to be, I mean, Republicans me didn't be, believe about, re- they believed like religion shouldn't have anything to do with politics. And then right. they embraced it was like the hands off of everything. And then they went full, yeah, adventure. Well, I mean, they, were, they were not into big spending. And then all of a sudden Trump spent more than anybody. So I believe unquestionably, I will say this and I will not back down that in my lifetime, yeah. the GOP has become a death cult. <laughs> They do have some so, really extreme. So let views. me just be clear: not that one. <laughs> um, not that one. Yeah. So Death cult. You're, you're definitely not in that one. Death and, cult. Uh, yeah. If you're a startup, you know you have to save where you can. I'm talking time, money, bandwidth, and that's why we love Coda. Coda is the one document to rule them all. In Coda, your text and your tables they can live together in the same document which means all your valuable data, objectives, and strategies are all in one place. Nothing's going to get lost. And your team is literally on the same page. Coda works right out of the box, and it's fully customizable. You can create a wiki for your team. You can onboard your new hires from anywhere. And you can react quickly to any changes in your business. And there are templates for basically anything. OKRs, reports, 360s, anything you need to do. In fact, check this out. We made a template for all of our founders because sometimes they don't know how to send an investor update. But if we give them a template, you know what? It becomes easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So if you go right now to thisweekinstartups.com slash investor updates, you can get a copy of this beautiful investor template that you can use to update your investors on how things are going. So it's a very simple call to action. I want you to join the productivity revolution. Head to coda.io slash twist to sign up and get a thousand dollar credit. Yeah. And you know, so but there's let, like so let, much failure here. There's so much failure. To, Maybe we can, you know, like so much failure. How do we like, and just to look at HB eight. Yeah. As a quick Let's summary establishes new background check requirements for firearm transfers between private parties. These are unlicensed individuals. Yeah. There are some places where you can just, people can sell guns to each other does not seem like a great idea um and neither do these gun shows and neither does there not being a background check in certain mm-hmm. places so specifically it's it's prohibiting the firearm transfer between private parties unless a licensed gun dealer i.e somebody who would take ownership of this transaction manufacturer or importer first take possession of the firearm to conduct a background check this seems like a really good idea mm-hmm. who's against this mm-hmm. i don't know it seems like maybe 10 percent of the you know, sort of extremists uh, on the gun control issue are against this concept. I don't think any of us want somebody selling out of the back of their car or at a gun show, a firearm to an 18 year old with mental illness without just checking. Does this person have mental illness? Does this person pass a background check? Like, this is a very simple concept. We have mental illness on the rise to a level that maybe the people who wrote the Constitution and created this great country of ours, maybe they didn't anticipate this level of mental illness and this level of firearm efficacy, like these things. We're going to come to the point where I push back on the mental illness thing, but keep going. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I I know that some of these people are, you know, racist, some of them are evil people. And then it does seem like this is a cohort of young, typically white video game, you know, introverted, like, kids who and, and so like, I mean, there's like a lot game. of things I just I like, I'm I think that's an easy, shooters. that's yeah. an easy out, right? Like, because we are not an outlier. And somebody actually, <laughs> I've been using these exact words, and somebody responded to you on Twitter, we are not an outlier in America when it comes to mental health. We don't have more mental health issues here than any other country. Right, of course. But we do but have this. We, we do have more guns. Yeah. But we're not gonna. So in the chessboard, the way I look at it is there's no way to ban the guns. If we can't even get gun control, reasonable background checks in place, yeah. I, I think getting to banning guns is just never going to happen so i'm kind of looking in a pragmatic way of like if we can't ban the diagram something like what can we do right just with this ultimate frustration it does feel like mental health in almost all of these mass shooting cases is a piece of it um so and and what's the downside of having more mental health services um or, or background checking people when they buy something like this for mental health i mean we we do check people when they buy fertilizer because we know we can build fertilizer bombs like there's some 
period of time, I guess, after 9-11 and, and, and um, Oklahoma yeah. City bombing that we, we thought about these things. Like maybe people buying large amounts of fertilizer, we should I mean, there used to be that or report it in some way or track it, trace right. it. We had an yeah. assault weapons ban in the United States for like yeah. a decade, for yeah. 10 years. So we, we have like data. It reduced yeah. gun deaths. Yeah. Um, it, the pro- prohibition does not apply to transfers or exchanges uh, or gifts between spouses in good faith. So that, I guess, makes sense. Um, and it passed the House March 11th, 2021, but it's not been voted on by the Senate. Anyway, this sparked a discussion for me about just how many how are our kids dying so you know sometimes i like to just open up the aperture because if we are going to put resources towards something we should put it towards things that we get the most bang for the buck that we get the most efficacy out of yeah so uh, a person named colin uh schlivert um tweeted at me uh palmer lucky uh and the chamath freeberg sacks and another VC saying school safety drone company, one to two drones patrol campus 24 seven trained to identify and flag suspicious behavior and weapons, i.e. using some kind of AI. Uh, Upon the flag, they swarm a swarm of drones released to harass suspect until police arrive who's in. Again, I applaud all ideas, no bad ideas. And and maybe someday this could possibly work. It's obviously not going to work now. Uh, Palmer lucky um responded very quickly schools are statistically safe uh they this would provide very low benefit to cost even if it worked perfectly and he would know he's building these kind of drones it takes a lot more than one or two drones to surveil a school so technically not possible right now and i'd have to agree with that i don't know if a swarm of drones are going to stop a mentally ill slash evil deranged school shooter with an ar-15 with an AR-15, yeah, uh, or and with you know who knows how many clips and and the and the capacity of the clips that seems to also be an issue. Yeah, I mean, it when takes you like have a, seconds. It takes seconds to slaughter a classroom with this. Yeah, gun. yeah, it's it's a very very like, powerful fast gun. It's 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 meant to kill people. Like let's be honest, it's not a hunting read. rifle. No, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. and what? yeah, the reloading is a key issue in all of this. Like I, I and you can get these 30, 40, 50, 60 clips for these different guns different states have different rules about it like the magazine size actually does matter and i don't know any reasonable argument for needing to have more than whatever a standard clip is six to ten um bullets in a gun for protection or safety self-defense hunting sport like you don't need 20 30 40 bullets in here if you do it's because you're in a wartime situation or you're going to murder a bunch of people in a mass shooting. Mm-hmm. There is a, th- there are many startups that have um, actually, uh, that are doing some good work in this area. One of them uh, is a, um, a, 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 I believe it's called Shot Spotter. I had looked at it as an investment. Uh, my producers will tell me if I'm mm-hmm. correct in this name in the chat, but it triangulates Molly. They have it actually in Oakland and, and some other areas. It will triangulate through sound microphones where the gun was fired from and then police get an alert not that a gun was fired in oakland or san mateo or san francisco's you know nearby neighborhood it'll tell you the street you know does uh, citizen use that the citizen app i think i don't know if they have something similar to that that. because i sometimes you'll get an alert in oakland that's like you know gun fired detected over here or whatever i think that's when somebody calls the police and say i heard a gunshot or a car you know but this ai is and triangulation service is able to tell like it happened on this city block um and uh the other one that's really um i think going to make a big difference is having uh ids on guns where each gun is id'd in some way now this is super polarizing but it would help you track guns um another uh, and then the other one is obviously like fingerprint technology or somehow having the gun um aligned with the person who owns it i.e the police officer so if you were to wrestle a cop and take the gun out it wouldn't do you wouldn't be able to uh, actually use that gun so there Mm -hmm. are some technologies here drones are not going to do it i mean even before a drone we we have open schools putting a fence around schools like in new york city we have very large fences but that's because people wander into them and they're on the street i'm not sure you're stopping somebody even with a 10-foot fence if a person wants to shoot up a school they just put a ladder up against the fence climb the fence 
yeah. and they're in the school or when you let kids in the school they just follow them in or they shoot them when they're going into school so you know the i, I think that's not going to be a solution listen right now capital efficiency and extending your runway is more important than ever so how are you going to do that well one easy way is to cut costs and run all of your SaaS apps on one platform and for that you need to check out odoo's amazing suite of business apps it's going to save you so much time and so much money using odoo means you won't have a bunch of different SaaS subscriptions to manage and all that money your credit card bill comes every month you're in shock everything you need is already on odoo and all you have to do is turn it on when you're ready. And Odoo will only charge you for the apps that you actually use. Odoo has over 40 main apps and over 16,000 in their open source community. We're talking sales, accounting, marketing automation, HR, website builders, and so much more. And this will streamline your business perfectly, aka no more transferring data back and forth from all these disparate products and services that you use. And you'll have one customer support contact across all of your apps, not 20. And the best part? Well, first app is free forever. They're going to give you $1,000 right now off your first implementation pack. That's right. You're going to go to odoo.com slash twist and get $1,000 off. What a generous offer. That's odoo.com slash twist. But yeah. this led to a discussion, um, I think, where Palmer Lucky responded. Companies have built products, um, you know, that do things like video and stuff like that, but the timelines don't work. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to countermeasures. You know, these, these school shootings take place in under 10 minutes, I think, typically. Um, it would be interesting to see the statistics on that. And, you know, most of the deaths are going to occur, sadly, in that period of time. So it's very, I, I think, um, even getting a, a video early, you know, maybe it makes a difference in a city. I'm not sure in a rural area if the police are 20 minutes away, if it makes a difference. Um, you know, yeah, as, as Palmer Lucky says here, the issue isn't finding active shooters, it's delivering death to them in time to matter, which mm. is everybody's got a, everybody's got a phone on them, they can dial 911, you, you got to kill the person uh, in order to stop the shooting where they have to run out of bullets or kill themselves. If saving this is where I, I jumped down the rabbit hole, if saving children is the actual goal, there are better areas to tackle far more children die of pools, for example, and I, and I, I had heard that statistic too, and I believe that to be true until I did a little research. Um, it turns out that things have changed over time. Um, and then I saw this um, New England Journal of Medicine uh, study, which we'll just pull up this one chart. And I think uh, this is important too, uh, to look at. Maybe you could break it down for the audience that's listening, Molly. Um, I mean, every other form of death in America for children has gone down except for firearm related injuries and motor vehicle crashes uh motor no, motor vehicle has gone down precipitously. it's gone down but look at uh, sorry but it's creeping up right if you look at this line you can see that it yeah, has declined on TikTok, yeah sorry yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm sorry i was just looking at the like sort of 2018 to 2020 yeah, just, this chart um, goes from yes, 20, you look, this is the over last 20 time, years over right, 20 years over 20 year period most For forms of death have have stayed roughly the same uh and firearm injury related injuries and it, it is notable There's by one the way other that, that went up massively drug which overdoses is and poisoning. drug overdoses and poisoning and so but look at the time frame in which that boom. happened by the way 2019 and up yeah it's right basically like there's like a huge central. spike in both of those in the last yeah. three years so covid combined with fentanyl i would say is probably the trend of those two things popping way up um and that probably means that people uh there might be some mental health issues here. So some number of the firearm injuries are self inflicted, uh, tragically, and the overdoses are, um, I think, yeah. probably largely like we should say suicides are a big number. Uh, suicides are a big part of that yes. firearm related injury number. So and then if you look at heart disease, drowning, drowning's actually been slowly trending down. Um, I think this is because people have um, gotten rid of uh, high dives. And I know it sounds silly, but like, those kind of high dives and um, uh, slides and stuff like that that were removed from pools were removed from a reason insurance and insurance had done the tables and said, this is how people die in pools. And slowly over time, people don't put them in pools. And slowly over time, people remove high dives and diving boards from pools and stop people from diving in pools. Uh, and I bet you cameras also helped this. But I did look at a series of startups, interestingly, Molly, uh, in drowning space, there were two specific ones, uh, my producers will grab the names of them and put them in the chat. Uh, one of them was in Sweden, I believe. They were putting cameras in public pools under the water. 
And then um, the lifeguard would have an iPad and it would show the number of seconds somebody was in the underwater for using computer vision technology uh, and then make them turn, you know, from green to blue to red or whatever, and then flash and then an alarm. So if somebody's underwater and they can hold their breath for more than a minute, you would get this. Um, and it's called Angel Eye. And we'll, we'll just pull that up there as a project. Um, and I think that this is a great place to look um, for startup ideas. I'm going to make the transition from gun shootings and like our legal system, which is the cause of this problem here in the United States. There's no doubt about that. But this is this week in startups. And I think there are, there are noble pursuits here. Um, and I think these drowning systems um, could reduce drowning to almost zero. Because if every camera, if cameras become that cheap, computer vision becomes that cheap, to, to throw a camera in a pool, even a home pool, to alert you when somebody's underwater for too long, and set an alarm off, then when you have your kids in the pool, and you happen to look down at your phone, or the doorbell rings, and you answer the door, you know, I like have abject moments of panic when this happens, I make the kids get out of the pool, or I make them hold hands, and I do a buddy system. But like, even the 30 seconds I run to open the door to get the pizza, and then run back. I'm in a uh, abject state of fear uh, mm -hmm. because I know about drowning being such a fast occurrence, having been uh, worked on an ambulance. And um, you know, the the other one was very interesting. It was a Bluetooth headset that you wear, like a tiara, almost, almost like um, uh, Wonder Woman's. She, you know, she has crown. That. Like, you, like the crown, you, the but parent, or the kid. The kid wears like a little crown, and it goes across your forehead to your temples and then it has a little thing it's it's like a headband is the way to say it wonder woman has not like a crown that sticks up she's got that like band yeah it's like, like a head, like a forehead it's like a head forehead band. band it looks pretty we'll cool we'll call it a headband so i swim band is a bluetooth enabled sensor and i said oh what does it do it um the bluetooth band and we'll, we'll show a picture of it here very interesting i almost invested in this company and they were just a little too early for me um but uh and, and i might actually relook at it um because you know, now i'm remembering it it was a little bit big in the first versions, but kids in a public pool would take them, put them on and go in. Now the Bluetooth doesn't signal you, Molly, interestingly, my, I was like, Oh, so it signals you when they've been underwater? Mm -hmm. it says no. What it does is Bluetooth doesn't work underwater. So when the Bluetooth connection dies, it's one of two situations. Oh, it's been underwater for a certain for number of seconds, long. or the yeah, batteries yeah. died or Bluetooth has failed the Bluetooth connection. So <laughs> With Apple, this thing would be going off all the time. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it has an Android receiver. Um, Unfortunately, it, uh, producer Justin points out it looks like that startup maybe didn't make it. It's a, hardware is hard, and getting yeah. kids to wear this would be hard. Um, it looks a little dorky, um, but I think like this in the startup graveyard might be one to look at again. I thought the computer vision underwater would be I a really similar, like more the elegant cameras. solution. Yeah, I really yeah. like the cameras, and I think the cameras could work above ground too. By the way. So I think somebody could just take a standard Nest drop cam and build software that when it sees somebody go underwater, it knows they're underwater, it knows their last location, and it mm -hmm. waits for them to pop back up. And it knows the number of people in the pool. So mm -hmm. even if it just told you there's six people in the pool, now there's five, or there's six people in the pool, three are underwater, three are above water. Just think what that does for a lifeguard in terms of just giving them a little more insight into what's happening in the pool. Um, and then just uh, my idea was to include a spotlight with it um so you have like a mechanical spotlight if somebody is in the pool it could or you could do this with ar as well let I me mean, imagine ar glasses that showed the lifeguard or the parent who was in the pool and how many seconds they were underwater or just counted but anyway here's uh let's i mean we can play the video maybe without sound um but uh, as you can see here um this system looks incredibly sophisticated i am i mean i have to say I know you mentioned this and I sort of agree, like it, maybe we should just move on to other, I'm having a hard time with the cognitive dissonance right now of like yeah. all of the ways that we keep kids safe in this country, except uh, the one, right? Yeah. Like it's a hard, this is a hard turn and yeah. I, I'm struggling with it. Like I have to okay. be honest all because right. it's sort well, of like, that's great. We should definitely keep kids from dying uh, in pools. Yeah. But like, it, it's a, I think this might not be the right tone for today. Okay. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? I, I yeah. I'm not trying I mean, to be critical. It's just sort of like if that's I, I can, an incremental know, improvement and it is. And I would be curious well, I, to know, producers, like, what do you think? Well, what I what I was thinking was I think we need to have a frank discussion of all the ways kids die and then rank them and then systematically go after them. And firearms is number one right now. Right. So firearms is number one, cars are number two. Right. I think self driving's got that covered. If, if 
we get self-driving cars, it's very hard for them to crash into each other. And then uh, fentanyl needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, and I was just making the point that like swimming is something people are actually working on. And I, you know. If you like delighting customers and your employees with amazing swag, well then swag.com is the place for you. It's the best place to buy, customize and distribute custom gifts, as well as promotional products. Because swag only carries items that people actually want to keep. They've curated an amazing collection of the best products across categories like tech, apparel, drinkware, office supplies, and more. And they offer some of the best brands in the game, like Yeti, Contigo, my favorite, Moleskin, another one of my favorites, Ember Mugs, I love those, and so much more. Remember, during the last read where I told you we were building out our Twist swag bag, well, I asked our fans of the pod to come up with some ideas. Tracy Milligan came up with a JBL speaker. It promotes group listening of the podcast. What a great idea. So we decided to mock it up. And here it is, the JBL Go 3 speaker with the twist of branding on it. How cool is that? So if you have any swag bag submissions, go to swag.com and find your favorite item. And then tweet it to TWI Startups or email producers at thisweekinstartups.com. You might just win that piece of swag. I want to give you 10% off your first order. I'm not joking. 10% off. It's going to be big money for you swag.com slash twist and use the promo code twist for 10 percent off yeah i get I'm not, it but i mean I'm, my intent is for people to actually be educated that despite the fact that people perceive drowning to be more than guns guns is actually number just passed and you know who knows it will stay that way cars but cars are going to continue to get safer is my gut and so it will be far by far and away guns will be the number one killer of kids but right. probably um, which honestly is almost the only time right like and it's so far away I it's just pretty, it's pretty far up there uh, and it in terms isn't, of and, and I don't mean to suggest it's something that we can solve on this show or that the tech industry oh. can solve like but I I just oh, sort no, of oh no yeah that's that's I, definitely I a disclaimer like, that we're not going to solve on, it yeah the, the solution is going to be some sort of reasonable legislation um and the tracking of these guns I do think the technology to track the guns is a big piece of this because if we knew where all the guns were that would be a pretty good start um and to and actually, an assault weapon ban let's be honest like yeah i don't know that why people need to have that level of assault weapons yeah it doesn't make any sense no um it's, it's they're way too powerful so anyway uh yeah. i wanted to talk about this i don't know maybe other people don't um or maybe you don't i don't i don't know i You're know i mean i think i think we could talk about it i just think like spending a whole bunch of time on solving drowning when we know when you look at this chart and the difference yeah. between those two, th it's just it's like it doesn't feel relevant and a bunch of kids just got slaughtered. And so like if we can right. focus our energy and God help us, if the if somehow startups could help, then let's focus them on. Let's only yeah. talk about guns like because it yeah. is crazy. Well, and, and it's crazy. the reason I bring this up is I think there's a misperception. So the reason I brought up drowning and yeah. that drowning could go to zero is that technology can solve that problem. So I think actually as we as we wrap this uh, segment. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking through this from like first principles mm -hmm. and looking at and in the, real time I'm not trying to call you in out, real time right like and, you're and, processing this in the moment we like we all yes. are like and and here's my thinking there is a misconception in the world that like drowning occurs more than the firearms it, do so you think that's to, a real misconception because it is the oh, guy I who has it. like a weapons country company well no like 10 years you ago I, I, I I've heard people say that I, you know, I, and I had never seen the statistics and I am a very well-read person and I had, and I had studied this space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at firearms, they've always been, you know, uh, you know, three or four times, three or four X, the instances of drowning. And I think this is doing it on per hundred thousand or something. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, my eyesight, I can't see the, the left hand or, uh, access, but I think it's deaths per 100,000. Per 100,000. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about, uh, is that say one death per 100,000 approximately for mm -hmm. drowning, yeah, for and drowning. then for firearms, it's been around four and then spiked up to six or something. Now, of course, these statistics are going, when there's a mass shooting, it, it's going to affect this, but yeah. um, it's still four X, five X, six, it's now six X. Yeah. And so I think where i've come to in having this discussion i think it's a productive discussion and i'm mm -hmm. sorry that somebody in the chat room felt it was disrespectful but um i think that's actually very productive i think there's a lot of misconceptions in the market right now um that the problem that problems can't be solved and that some problems are bigger than others mm -hmm. lesson one 
th- there's this is the number one killer of kids now guns yeah some from suicides some from shootings some from shootings and crimes right th- this is all shootings put together so right. we obviously could break them down and then there might be different approaches to each one there is no technological solution is the other factor here there's no technological solution to solving mass shootings of kids there's not a technological solution right. there is a solution to getting people to the where the firearm was and tracking firearms and making it so police firearms you know are triggered so that was the other thing i wanted to sort of unpack here is that there's this belief amongst people so false belief number one drowning is more and guns are not a major issue guns are the number one issue now they've exceeded cars issue number two technology won't solve it right we've gotten to that point you got to it faster than i did number three the other things on this list are in fact being solved and will be solved by technology so that's another revelation i just had in this very moment we could see drowning go to zero and we could see car deaths go to zero or relatively close to zero with technology Mm -hmm. it's not going to happen with guns yeah it's just not going to happen and it's not going to happen either with fentanyl actually now that i think about it if people are i don't know there's a technological solution to fentanyl overdoses there is narcon what what is that stuff called is it there are some really interesting drug-based solutions like there's a there's ketamine and then there's one that starts with an l but they're not necessarily technology specifically yeah there's narcan which actually is saving 75 so that is i guess a technological solution so that that reverses 75 percent of overdoses in san francisco i Mm -hmm. think it's the latest number so we have like nine a day and two are fatalities and seven recover so that's about 75 percent right there yeah um and there are testing strips um so for people who are taking pills and thinking they're taking xanax or whatever you can actually test so that that is another technological solution but um yeah it seems like there are two issues here that are spiking both of them have to do with mental health both of them have to cannot be solved with technology both of them need to be solved with our government yeah that's the bottom line fentanyl yeah. mental health and gun control these yeah. things there is there are, there are no technological solutions and if you have one please speak up but i can't think of one right. so to I think that wraps this up nicely. I'm sorry yeah. if people felt it's too soon, but this is the way my mind works. Yeah. I no, immediately you're go to solutions. You're a really analytical person and you're like, what can I solve and what can't I solve? Right. And I respect that. I think there's a lot of I, value yeah. in going down that road. And I'm, I, again, I am not trying to call you out. I think we just, I was feeling like we were spending a little much time on the pool <laughs> and it was starting to be like, we may have strayed kind of far. From the issue. I, I, from I respect that too, Molly. A I, truly I, terrible issue. It's but a terrible issue. I think your wrap up, like, it makes perfect sense. There is we can solve and there's there's that we need help solving. And the government has to do it. And the government and we need has to, get these, to do we need it. To get, we need to get some number of these 50 senators to just listen to their spouses, their family members, their constituents, their children, and just take a long, deep look in the mirror. Is the NRA money worth it? And does reasonable gun control, if 90% of the country want it, yeah. like, why wouldn't you just take the win? We have to give them a path to winning in this reasonable gun control, not banning. If, once you say banning, this becomes unreasonable and becomes a binary switch. I want to ask you, actually. Can we make it a stat? Can we just make it a slider? Like, let's just add something that maybe reduces it. Can we try? Can we experiment? Just try. With the gun ban totally. and just try. I mean, please. And gun buybacks. Some, there was just a really successful program, actually, where oh, they works. literally offered people gas money to turn their guns in great idea and got a great ton idea. of guns right so like we could raise a ton of money for buybacks maybe right like mm. let's get the let's get your <laughs> rich friends raising money for buybacks i want to ask you a question as okay. a um as a master negotiator because i okay. did see someone a political commentator commentator say you know for decades literally mm. for decades democrats have been saying we're not trying to take your guns we're just talking about reasonable regulation yes that has not worked at all so like what if <laughs> what if we said we're going to take your f-ing guns because that's it right like we've tried reasoning with you and there is mm. no conversation that you ever have with your spouse or your friend or your pastor or whatever that gets you there so now we're taking all your guns and that's the proposal and then do you end up backing out in an assault weapons ban mm. like i'm just like is the message like the messaging has not worked so do you take I the messaging been up bo- a notch or not I, I would not escalate it that way. Yeah. I would try to build consensus around the mental health issue because I think we can all agree on that because we all have ki- we all have kids. We've also seen what's happened during COVID. We all have seen people we know or even experienced ourselves mental health. So it's kind of like 
I COVID think when, has made it worse. Like we do need a, men, a Marshall oh, Plan for I mental health. I think those two spikes are mental health. So like I think Marshall we, Plan for mental health. However, absolutely. when you take a Mar- when you take a mental health spike and add in more guns than there are Americans. Yeah. So what's happening now, this is the perverse thing with the dialogue. The people who are gun enthusiasts, not reasonable gun control folks, but the enthusiasts, yeah. they believe that, let's say, let's say it's, I'm making up a number, 10% on each side. 10% of people want to ban the guns permanently. We come to your house, we take your guns. You have no more guns. Not allowed, we change the constitution. Then there's 10% on the other side who are like, I can buy whatever I want, as much as I want. I'm not an evil person. I'm a responsible person. And it's in the document. I get to have them. Mm-hmm. If, you, if those two groups of people are the ones controlling the dialogue, yep. and the dialogue they're controlling is actually exacerbating the problem. The people who are like, we're going to get your guns eventually, and, and they're, they're vocal about it. We want a, a ban on all guns. Uh, why do you need a gun? Um, and uh, those are driving the sales because people are anticipating mm-hmm. that the AR-15 will be banned. So every time a shooting happens, the next day, and this will happen, we'll see it in the next two weeks, you'll see a bunch of stories, this happens every time, that yeah. AR-15s are sold out. People go buy these guns after these instances because they know there's a chance that that instance, I remember the Vegas shooting, I, how many people died in that, 40 or something? 50, 50 some. It was 50? Mm-hmm. Ay, ay, ay. Like, they, after that, gun sales went through the roof because yep. they know that the, yep. the dialogue will be re-engaged. So as a negotiator, I think we have to say, w- we want to stop people who have mental illness from acquiring guns. We just want this standard federal waiting period and every gun to go through every person to go through a background check full stop period that's it and my idea on it would be insurance and i think weapons ban like come on come on yeah that would be the next piece and you know if if we could get there i don't know that we can get there i I think the other possibility is we create an organization that is not called the nra it's called um responsible gun ownership Mm-hmm. And we create an organization called Responsible Gun Ownership, or Responsible owners, right? Gun like Owners. RGO, yep. Mm-hmm. RGO. We start RGO, Responsible mm-hmm. Gun Owners. This is how I would do it. We fund it with $250 million. Mm-hmm. And then we go to the 50 people who are on the right, and then some of the people on the left, and say, would you like to rejoin Responsible Gun Ownership? Here's the manifesto. One, yeah. two, three, four. Y- nobody needs 30 clips. Um, if you want an AR-15, you have to insure it, and you have to insure it based on the number of deaths that have occurred from this gun, right? That might be reasonable, uh, mm-hmm. or uh, something that could happen. And then we start giving money to people. Yeah. And you just out-donate the NRA. Now you're and talking like an American. And then a Republican has to say, am I taking, you know, 250K from the NRA or right. 500K from responsible gun owners? National right. Rifle Association sounds like a bunch of maniacs. Responsible gun owner sounds like the one you want. And That's then when you great. go, totally. Go, now we're off. talking. And then RGO sets up a fund for buybacks. Absolutely. Because some of what's going to happen if, is even yeah. if you have background checks and even if you have, there are so many guns now, yeah. you know, that it's like, huh. it's hard to stop the back of the truck sales. So you start a huge fund and yeah. you take donations. Yeah. Because, you know, it, I always think about, um, there's like Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It's considered one of the most effective political campaigns in American history. Think and it was the literally framing on that one. Think about the framing on that one, because they were like, yeah. we are our kids are dying. Yeah. And we are not having it anymore. I mean, drunk driving was like not Ooh. illegal. And okay, Mothers wait, Against did, Drunk Driving came in and they were just like, nope. Yeah. Moms. I mean, you're going to argue Moms. with your mom. Right. Like, I'm not arguing with my mom. She's here. Right. She's in the other room. She came to town. I'm going to hit you with my Trust slipper. Me. And you better, she, but she's like, like, I, somebody said you dropped an F-bomb on your podcast. <laughs> God, here <laughs> we go. So <laughs> here, here, you want to punch it up? We somehow incorporate in the RGO the word parents. So yes, responsible parents gun parents. owning parents. <laughs> you got GOP though, unfortunately. Um, oh, I just kind of a good troll. <laughs> it kind of is. <laughs> <R-G-O-P>. GOP. <laughs> Respo- somebody but help me. Somebody mothers, in the uh, Mothers for responsible gun ownership. Parents. Something. Parents, parents for responsible parents. gun ownership. Mm-hmm. Parents for responsible gun ownership. Something like mm-hmm. that. That would do it. If we if we did parents. Yeah. 
Uh, and you have to, it has to be a lobbying organization. I mean, I think that's the mistake, right? Because public pressure does nothing in this country anymore. Like post, 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 post Citizens United, it's the money. In fact, somebody in the chat even said, like, figure out a way to uh, turn gun control into a money making opportunity, and boom, we're there. I have another solution here. Um, a friend of mine, he liked a certain asset and he decided maybe he'd buy it. Mm-hmm. He liked it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, okay. Cult is a company, right? They make the AR-15, am I correct? I, I think AR-15 is the brand name of Cult. Now, Cult is a company, right? Cult is a company in the world. Yeah. yeah. Cult. Company. It's maybe a publicly traded wants, company. Maybe your friend wants to buy that and said, well, divest, one, start there. So who owns the Cult company? Like, is it owned by, it's a 167-year-old is it uh, public? company. It's not public. Yeah. Dennis Velux is the CEO. It's in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, it's a subsidiary of a Czech holding company, Colt CZ Group. So it's not even wow. a U.S. company. Czech CZ Group has revenue of six billion dollars, and um, it's got a bunch of subsidiaries. It On was February eleventh, the for company announced it would twenty million dollars. Sorry, two hundred twenty million dollars. Why don't That's we just nothing. buy Colt? Let's buy that. Why don't we offer them three hundred million for Colt? Great. And then we just go to the Colt product line, and we take the AR fifteen out, and we leave mm-hmm. the other guns. Yeah. And then we have Colt. If you want to buy a Colt gun. You have it's to buy a lock. Uh, you have to buy a lock. You have to go through training. No, I mean, like, we make it fingerprint locked, right? Like, we high tech sure. out of that thing. It's fingerprint locked. You have to go through sure. training. It has to be insured. Let's just buy cult. And, the, and then you just keep buying these things and taking them off the market. Love this. Love it. I think that would be an easier solution. I mean, I, I would just talked about putting 500 million. Like, if we could just buy a piece of cult, mm-hmm. buy a controlling interest. Mm-hmm. Um, or if, th- if this company owns it, if this. Yeah. Cult CZ Group is publicly traded, which I can't tell if it's publicly traded. Let me just type in the word stock at the end of there. Cult CZ Group stock price. And then you'll find out if it's publicly traded. Okay, it is a publicly traded company. The ticker symbol is FRA6QS, whatever that means. And the it doesn't even have a market cap here. Hmm. So anyway, I, I mean, found there it. are there are probably other companies it's got to be trading on foreign exchanges uh, but it, you know the it's always the problem with these foreign exchanges that you can't calculate because they're uh the floats are different the amount of shares available to the public can be All different right, so ar-15s I, it looks like yeah. a lot of people make ar-15 so there's yes. that the question there is, is that. how do we buy colt and make an ar-15 that's better that's like you know yeah. it, fingerprint i f- fingerprint secure I, anyway i mean I, look, or like, just keep buying the companies just keep this buying is how them. I, like, I really want to validate the idea of at least trying to find some solutions because honestly, it's so hopeless feeling right now. Like, it feels so hopeless yeah. that this is a problem that's been happening for five decades. Like, my entire life, adult life. in America, my entire adult life in America, this has been happening. And we every didn't time have when we were kids, the 70s and 80s, this didn't happen. No, 90s, it really started didn't. happening like. When did Columbine happen? That was the well, late the 90s. The assault weapon ban, yeah. And then the assault weapon ban expired in 2004. And mm-hmm. pretty much every major mass shooting since then has involved an AR-15. Yeah. Or at least it since is. like Tree of I, Life Synagogue. Like, so anyway, I, I think we're right. just like, we're trying not to feel hopeless. That's what we're trying. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't feel the need to explain my position on wanting to talk about it. Um, I am absolutely think all discussions about this issue are great. Anybody with great ideas, bring them to the table. Let's yeah. go. I understand it's maybe the timing is a little bit off for me to immediately go to solutions. Uh, I oh, I want to go to those solutions. I just didn't want to talk about. I have a partner in life, and sometimes I don't know if you've ever had this dynamic, Molly, where a partner you have, you know, there's a problem, and you come in and you have solutions, and they're yes. like, "I'm not looking for a solution. I'm looking for a hug or something." This is such like, like a constant relationship conversation. Like literally, it's a, it's a, it's a like, it's a refrain in my relationship. It's like, do you want me to listen or solve? Yes. Like, and we'll ask each other specifically yeah. because otherwise, like immediately it's like solve, 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 solve. And listen, I want to, I would spend. Are, do you, wait, which one are you? Are you default listener or default solver? Uh, I can or are you like be, flex? I know it doesn't seem like it, but I can annoyingly be default solver. I like, think I'm you're default solver for sure. Yeah, I'm default I'm solver for sure. for sure. I mean, journalist slash turned investor slash mm-hmm. broadcaster. You're a default solver. Yeah. I am. And I annoyingly most like default you solver. You need to do this. You need to do this. I, you need to do this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm the ultimate default solver and like, 
I've had to retrain myself that not everybody goes to solution. Like, yeah. I, and it was just my training, like as a working on an ambulance, being a black belt in karate, you know, ha having this experience that I grew up with was something tragic happens, take action. Yes. And so you're when you're running action. into a car accident or somebody's on the ground, like the first call I ever went on the ambulance was somebody had been stabbed right above their heart. That set my brain up for when there's go, a tragedy, go, go. take action. Mm -hmm. And we had to go in and put the mask pants on that person and, you know, cut their members only jacket, which I remember it like it was yesterday. My God, this, this Italian guy had been stabbed in a fight over a girl outside of TJ Bentley's in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, Third Avenue and 71st Street, I believe. And uh, he's wearing a members only jacket. And he's his whole chest is like his whole this is blood everywhere. And uh, guy on the end says cut the jacket. I did you have shears? They're incredibly sharp, but they have a little round circle at the tip of them. Mm -hmm. So that you can take your shears, you know, and not stab somebody with them. Right. And but you can just roll. zip right up their jacket or like zip right up paper. a pair of jeans. They cut like that. Wow. So I shear his jacket. And I cut the arm of his jacket because we can't get we can't get it off of him. So I'm just shearing it off. We just open up and I shear his shirt. He goes, Oh, my members only jacket. I remember like it was yesterday. Oh my God. The, uh, the, the, the EMT wow. in charge turns around, puts his hands on the guy's shoulders, looks him dead in the eyes and says, guy, you got a lot more problems than this jacket. And like my heart just sunk. And then when I got the shirt off, I kid you not, like a, like a public school water fountain that, you know, just dribbles water oh, out. Oh, Jason. Droop, droop, just like every heartbeat, just a little bit of blood droop, droop. And they were like, this guy's not making it. And we had to put the mask pants on him which is a blood pressure cuff that was created in, I don't know if it's World War II, but when you are, have lost so much blood, they yeah. put these blood pressure cuffs, mast pants on your legs, and we blow them up like a blood pressure cuff in order to take the blood in your legs and send it to your organs so we get another three or four minutes to get you to the hospital. He was saved. We saved him. Uh, it was the first call I ever went on. My, my brother Josh's first, second call, as a firefighter, his second call. You want to yeah. take a guess at what that was? I, I mean, I know the story and you should. 9-11. Yeah. 9-11. So know. a family of service. <laughs> like, yeah. And you know, it's just, it's the way I'm wired. So yeah. uh, for folks and who are still grieving. I want to be clear. I would spend mm -hmm. three hours talking about solutions to gun control. I just wanted to get us off the swimming pools. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like I'm like Sorry, about, I went down the swimming pool rabbit like, hole. Just like, like my version of, of action oriented is like only the big thing. Like every other noise goes away. Yeah. And I like laser in on the one thing. And then when I, you know, anyway, yes. I'm anyway, a, I think I'm this, an is, what's, this is what's solver. making our pod work is that you and I are slightly different. Yeah. And we have these like very engaging discussions. I think this yeah. is a very engaging discussion and uh, everybody gets to listen to it. Uh, yeah. What what do we pivot to now? Uh, because <laughs> this is going to be an even harder pivot. <laughs> so no matter uh, what, pools. it's going to be an awkward Cerebral? pivot. Maybe cerebral is a way to go now, actually. Because mental yes. health. And cerebral is perfect because we have a massive mental health crisis. And Tito, Tito. companies that are just trying to uh, go ahead and come in and vulture right off of it. Okay. So we've uh, been. So I want to yeah. preface this by saying our producers have been up on this story for Weeks. a month or longer, particularly oh, producer month, yeah. Rachel, over a month. Cerebral is a mental health startup that provides telehealth subscriptions to Adderall and other stimulants. It oh. has uh, recently been probed by the DOJ over its prescription methods. Now, if you're okay. like under 30, you uh, have most likely gotten an ad, evidently, like on TikTok or Instagram or anywhere for a telehealth prescription in the last year because all these regulations yes. were loosened during COVID. And, and actually, right. both anecdotally and I think scientifically, there were a lot of, um, uh, there were a lot more uh, diagnoses of ADHD in kids because once kids went home to remote learning, whatever mm. ADHD they had had all of a sudden was like rendering them non-functional, right? Because you can't, because if like, if you have an attention problem and then you're trying to learn on a screen and mm -hmm. school is suddenly the world's yeah. TV show, like, yeah, forget it's it. brutal. Yeah. I mean, forget and also it. being in a room with other people who are paying attention will make you pay attention more. Yes. So there's like a peer effect, just like going to the movie theater and not taking your phone out and not talking might be slightly different when you're in a movie theater with 100 people than when you're home watching a movie, you might very much talk to your partner yep. or whoever else is in the room. And you might very much 
take out your phone, right? So there is some peer totally. uh, impact there as well. Yeah. So, and so these diagnoses were going way up. The telehealth regulations were were mm-hmm. loosened and companies came in to, let's say, generously fill the void, mm-hmm. including this mental health startup Cerebral, um, which was prescribing Adderall, Xanax, other controlled substances. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, Xanax is a highly addictive, deadly product. Like I know somebody who overdosed on Xanax. It's oh God, very really? dangerous. Yeah, like when I was a kid, um, somebody uh-huh. who had depression and they had a Xanax prescription. But from what I understand, I'm no doctor, but um, in that instance, I was educated that it's highly addictive, um, and it, um, you know, it could basically kill you if you take yeah. too many Xanax, and it's recreationally a very popular drug. I mean, I've been out and seen people offer each other a Xanax and have a cocktail, which seems like a really dangerous idea uh, because it calms people down and it makes them, yeah. And in Um, in moderation, it can help people And the same with Adderall. It's highly abused. It's a schedule two drug, but it can, you know, really help people with ADHD. But basically I think what happened is that that cerebral and, you know, uh, we have some experience with this made it just uh, absurdly easy to get these prescriptions. Like it was like the ADHD pre-screening behavioral questionnaire takes two minutes to go through. And the questions are like, how often are you distracted by activity or noise around you? Um, always. How do you guess that one? How often do you? me when I took my gun test in California, the questions were so obvious that I didn't read the book. The guy's like, you'll pass it. You don't need to read the book. Just go over there and do it. And I looked at the book. Somebody had put a little dot next to the right answers. Uh, I don't know if it's the owner of the place or whatever. But anyway, there was one question that was like, what's the proper way to store a handgun? And it was like in a locked box with the gun in one locked box and the bullets in another locked box. Another one was holding it in the air. Oh, my holding it towards the ground in a holster. And I was like, well, gee, process of elimination. I'm guessing waving a gun in the air or the ground is not a great idea. A holster seems pretty reasonable. But my gosh, a lockbox seems the most reasonable. So I'm going to go ahead and go with A. I'm going to go with A. And literally, with a. those were all the questions. I got like two questions wrong. And the questions I got wrong were about um, the caliber of guns. Like, uh, and like they had, s- you know, some questions about what were the caliber of different types of guns. And I was like, yeah. I have no idea like what the caliber of rifles are versus whatever. I mean, I did subsequently. Um, so, yeah. so it's these those questions. Kinds of questions. I saw a chat log. Mm-hmm of these questions Mm -hmm. and answer from somebody who knew somebody Mm -hmm. who did it. It was a joke. It's a joke. Like an absolute joke. Yeah. Do you ever lose your keys at home? Oh, Adderall for you. Like what? (laughs) Uh, Okay. (laughs) Oh, okay. Do you feel anxiety is, yeah, keeping you from from focusing at work? Yeah, I do. It's like, well, let me say, let me think here. Adderall, Xanax, Adderall. Is it Tuesday? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I need some Tuesday. Yeah. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. No problem. It's we're we're sliding into the weekend, everybody. Uh, Okay. So Julio time. So it's so easy. So the DOJ announces this investigation. And at that point, then cerebral board members uh, uh, replaced the CEO, Kyle Robertson, who was also a co-founder. He controls three of the seven board seats. I mean, this is a majority, but close. Yeah. But close did not attend the meeting where this was decided. So they like okay. snaked him. Um, as producer Justin says, one point for governance. They cut his access to Slack without advance notice. He had not agreed to depart his role as of Tuesday of last week. He's contesting the outcome of the election, if you will. And gotcha. he he has claimed that it was like illegal, and he th- said he's being made a scapegoat for the company's issues. So it's turned into this like huge drama mm. with uh, this guy. Kyle sort of refusing to leave. Dr. David Mao, the president and chief medical officer and a board certified psychiatrist, mm. which Kyle Robertson is not, uh, will now take over the CEO position. And they're sort of just trying to like do whatever they can to move mm. past this. But yeah. it's a mess. It's a mess. Um, I, there's, it's, uh, there are probably a class of drugs that are not abused uh, or don't have as much abuse potential um, that people can responsibly do telemedicine for and in a pandemic sure it's responsible you probably want as a psychiatrist before giving psychiatric drugs 
to be doing at the minimum a video consultation. But my understanding is these were just chat. They were not video. Mm -hmm. so, I so I think one of the producers knows somebody who knew Audio. somebody. You do call. Who did this. You, you do, do a call. call. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if one of the producers wants to explain what their friend told them, I'm, I'm okay with that. If they don't, that's okay too. But I, I know one of our producers had a friend who had a friend who did it and mm -hmm. had a good experience or had a, a seamless experience. But A way too good experience. It's a chat log and then a phone call occurs. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep. Uh, a friend of yours has had an experience with this and, and related to you. It's a chat that's very easy to answer the questions followed by a, a brief phone call. Basically like a type form survey and uh, then followed up by schedule an appointment, like a Calendly link, uh -huh. basically like that. And then uh -huh. uh, you go through some verification as to who you are with just like license uploading and yeah, yeah, yeah than a, uh, a phone call. I think sometimes it is a video call. Huh. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. For I wonder how long the phone call is, like a five, 10 minute call, phone call or something. The phone call usually less than 30 minutes. Yeah. A few people. I've All right. to. I would say if this is not video um, and doesn't have one in person, you probably, unless it was like in a very rural area where it was super inconvenient to get there, this these kind this schedule drugs maybe a little friction would be better. Yeah, it's you know it's really interesting because it arcs right back to the top of the show, which is like what problems can can tech solve? Like it seems really you know it yeah. we tend to sort of want to be like, well, we're in this pandemic. There are growing mental health issues. They are real. Like kids mm -hmm. are being diagnosed with ADHD because they're failing at school and with remote learning, and people have. Uh, anxiety for very real reasons mm -hmm. will come in with telehealth and like make this easier and then in some ways that's great and in other yep. ways maybe there should in fact be more friction like producer rachel points out her sister is 17 and could totally steal her id and fake this like if we had electronic medical records that this could connect to like there uh. are there are services now that are doing um you know prescribing ketamine for treatment resistant depression I know and somebody they, who's doing this company. It's like, I think there's one mind balloon. I do too. Another mind one. Yeah. Yeah. Mind balloon is one. There's another one. Um, and they're doing ketamine lozenges. Um, right. Which uh, I guess help with depression or something uh, and anxiety, but I don't think it's without cost. So, you right. know, if you're it's doing expensive, it right. First of all, which oh, is I, think is, yeah. I think it's valuable that it's expensive, but also like, I sort of feel like, in that case, if it's treatment resistant depression, they should be able to access. I mean, I know we have like the electronic health records in this country on top of everything yeah. else. But imagine if you could sort of interface with those health records and say there is a verifiable history of this. And if there's not, then you need to see a doctor in person. Yeah, I think a counselor in a lot of these situations is critically important and a mm -hmm. counselor that is specific to you. So they can get a read on if this is an abuse type situation, or it's a legitimate use of the drugs. Yeah. Um, if if there is like some super downside to it, I don't know how mind bloom works if that requires an in person consultation or if it's all virtual. Um, but I did hear from somebody who's working on that maps organization, um, which is like the pro psychedelic MDMA that um, I think it's Portland. Well, I'm sorry, Oregon um, is going to um approve psilocybin the active ingredient in uh, mushrooms for ptsd therapy and stuff yeah, and that mdma great. is going to become next year uh federally possibly uh prescribable for therapists and, and mm. couples therapists and ptsd and all that stuff which is actually where it originated so if you don't know maps that's the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies and um i met the person who started at some point and then my friend tim ferris there's a name drop um has been um donating a bunch of his uber windfall to uh different organizations i think john hopkins is doing a study for him mm. i don't know i think it's mdma so i think those two mdma aka molly um and uh I own, um, will be the first two to um be at therapists and i think they're going to specifically work with an interesting beachhead market the va yeah great good. because we have all these ptsd soldiers who saw horrible things in war and it turns out you know some of these psychedelics and uh, mdma can help them in therapy resolve issues uh, i was talking to a friend who's working on these studies they said like it's can be 10 times faster 
yeah. to resolve these issues because people can access their emotions. And if you're suffering from PTSD and you're a tough soldier, you know, you it might be a hard nut to crack. It might take 10 years of therapy. And mm-hmm. they said, like, it's unbelievable, Jason. Like, you, you might have somebody in three sessions process the death of a friend or, you know, a horrible instance. Um, so I like to it's- keep an open mind towards this stuff. But this one seems a little bit maybe taking too much friction out. And if it was for, you know, we, we had a company that was doing um, people's hepatitis C and, you know, UTI medications. And so if that's embarrassing, and it's a pain in the neck for a woman to go to the doctor or a male to go to the doctor for ED medicine, like those kind of things, like, mm-hmm. eh, like, yeah, sure. You know, like, th- that doesn't seem like Xanax where you could die from it. There's a, there's a valid use of Xanax, there's abuse of Xanax. I mean, it's pretty obvious here, folks. There's a drug called, I was looking this up because I talked to a startup that is trying to, that is using, there's a drug called Ibogaine, which is a member yeah. of that sil- um, psychedelic family. Yeah, Ibogaine is like a, another plant medicine. Um, it's a, yeah. And what it's not shown, ayahuasca. No. Not but psilocybin, it's in, but it's another Much like one. mushrooms, right? It, it's yeah. in that family of psychedelics, but they say that it, but it can interrupt the brain loop of opiate addiction. Yes, I did hear about that. What I think is so fascinating about all this is I'm obsessed with the sort of like the physical part of neuropsychology, like talk therapy, you know, there really are literally the grooves that get carved in your brain. And so no matter how much you talk, like the idea about talking about it is that you can regroove, but some of these, but some of these medications that enable neuroplasticity smooth out the grooves like it's literally physical you know we think of the brain like it's not a physical thing it's part of our body it's literally physical and i'm like obsessed with this as a topic i just think it's so interesting and makes perfect sense as an area of study that you don't necessarily need to get uh through an app and a ton of well and startups have a a role to play here because a lot of these drugs are going to need to have um some delivery mechanism around them so there are therapists who need to be trained in this mm-hmm. um and uh there are settings so if you've ri- read michael pollan's great book a whole new mind uh, mm-hmm. highly recommend it he talks about set and setting yes. so the setting uh and the context of this uh, and your intentionality are absolutely critical that's why like just doing massively psychoactive drugs and going to a rave is like one experience like oh look at the pretty lights but that's not going to be the experience of being in with a therapist saying, hey, this traumatic thing happened to me. It makes me sad. My friend mm-hmm. died. You know, um, my mom and dad didn't love me enough. Whatever your trauma is or whatever issue you're going through, you know, he's, he's very clear that, you know, having some intentionality uh, and, the, and the setting and the context and, and the process that you go through. Also, the dose is super important. Mm-hmm. That's the reason this is actually so important that we come up with back to having a functional government and a legal structure here yeah you know if you take too much or too little these things don't work or they or they they have unintended consequences so you know somebody taking this ibogaine is it called Mm -hmm. i mean who knows like you know what one unit of ibogaine you know might do nothing five might be absolutely perfect for dealing with your opioid addiction and 10 might make you more addicted who knows Mm -hmm. like these are very powerful you know uh, drugs that need to be studied and that's where legalization comes in i i really think like there's like this fentanyl thing is a super drug that kills people but then the other things would give people a path who want to use or are in the loop it would give them a path to get the experience of getting high and forgetting about their problems but maybe incrementally work towards resolving their problems Mm -hmm. and if they only have one option which is a five or ten dollar hit of fentanyl on turk street you know here in san yeah. francisco like what what have we done we've just yeah. routed people to the darkest outcome yeah and, and that's i think you know the the problem with san francisco is they, they've they've really incented everybody in the country who is addicted to this to come to one location for the least policing and the lowest price and and it's a really hard thing that took I a think. turn well I everybody mean, it's, it's, in the country uh, it turns out the I think it's something like 80 or 90% of the people who are addicted to fentanyl in San Francisco and in, in, in those shelters and everything are not from San Francisco. Wow, we are importing them. Uh, because ev- ev- anybody who is addicted knows there are certain places in the country that are permissive and certain places if you go score fentanyl, you're gonna be in jail. 
You don't want to mm. be in the South mm-hmm. and like be smoking fentanyl on the street in Alabama. I think the cops are going to tackle you and put you in jail for six months. Mm. Whereas like, where can you do it out in the open? And where can you steal out in the open from Walgreens and get a bed and get services? So if you pay for something, you might get more of it. And it turns out the price of drugs is directly correlated with policing. Yeah. Yeah. Higher policing means your drug dealers, and I, listen, and some of them are victims too, I get it. Because the drug dealers are off the street for three weeks, you have to hire another drug dealer. So now you're paying for two drug dealers, your cost goes up. So the reason, yeah. when, when you have no policing, the drugs become a hundred times cheaper, 10 times cheaper than they do in places with serious policing. Like to, to deal drugs in Japan, like you're going to jail in a Japanese prison, which is not pleasant for 10, 20 years, you know, if you do it in Singapore, you're going to jail for life. So the cost is so high that the drugs are extremely expensive because to be a drug dealer means you're right. going to jail Risking for life. your life. Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, you're literally going hmm. to get put to death in some countries. And so I'm not advocating for that. But having no cost means costs become extremely attractive to an addict who only right. cares about the next hit. That's just how pernicious the drug is. Yeah. So you That's know, horrible. with startups doing this stuff, I think having some, uh, the one thing I like about this story, if I'm being honest, is that the president is a board certified psychiatrist. Now, the new guy. Yeah. The new guy. Well, mm-hmm. uh, was he with the company before? Yeah, or yeah, no? yeah. Yeah. The new CEO. So they so did was, have somebody. So they know. did have him. Yeah. I mean, there, there were, there were probably always benefits to this. It's just like, it was too easy. It was too easy because you're incentivized to then get an $80 yeah. a month subscription, right? It's like a private healthcare i bet you issue. the other i bet you they're paying the doctors on consultation uh and that could also be a problem here mm. because if you're a doctor the quicker you get off the phone and do another prescription you get more payment so the incentive could be problematic here right maybe a solution is the doctors have to be full-time staff getting a full-time salary and not be paid based upon yeah per like it's, it's gig work i it's have a right. feeling this is gig work Probably. so it's like an uber driver is going to drive sadly you know, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, DoorDash drivers, sometimes they're unsafe drivers because the f- time is money. The faster they drive, the more drives they can do, the more money they make. And so there's there needs right. to be some guardrails yeah. on that, which is why they are checking people's speeds. Right. You know, like, uh, which is, and, it's, and, stuff like and that. it's sort of like, I feel like that's phase two of... Because we the the pandemic, they loosened restrictions on telehealth, which was really important and saved a lot of lives, and you had to get people access to health. And then phase two needs to be, if you're operating a telehealth company, what are the rules? And maybe some of those are the rules. Like, you can't have gig work, or you can't have commission, right? Like, you shouldn't have, there shouldn't probably be commission, and I'm not saying that they have this, but if they did, there probably should not be commission, say, on how many people you sign up for your Adderall subscription. That's obviously going to be a distorting mechanism that you don't want. So I sort of feel like phase two, if we had a functioning government (sighs) would be to Mm. come up with some rules on how these things should operate. I mean, one of the nice things, like when you go to France is they've really thought this through, like if you want to get a Z pack, you know, like the, you know, if you get the flu or whatever, they're like, you can buy that over the counter. The pharmacist can just consult with you. Right. And so when I was there, I had a cold. I was like, you know, I got this kind of like symptoms. I don't want to get graphic. (laughs) uh and he's like well what color is your phlegm and i was like oh gosh yeah this is really right, graphic but anyway right. he's like yeah z-pack is for you you it's, it's viral or it's not viral or whatever i guess i can tell from some of these things um breaking news as we wrap the show jack mm-hmm. dorsey has stepped down from twitter's board today the board was meeting today uh they had a shareholder meeting i don't know if that means they're releasing their results because i thought during this transaction they weren't going to re- release results they said they would stop releasing results um but uh it seems like does it seem like it got kind of ugly though this meeting like evidently he was accused um of backstabbing his twitter board his own twitter board by helping elon musk as shareholders met like i can't tell if this was like a rage quit or if he was always intending to quit but it sounds like it was not sounds like it may have been a slightly pointed he he was going to quit when he he was going to resign because he was when he came down as CEO, I think there was some natural tension happening between squares product roadmap. Yeah, and or I'm sorry, blocks roadmap and Twitter's IE payments. And in the Elon Musk plan um, that people have covered in the press, there was talk of payments being a significant portion of that. 
mm-hmm. if Jack is doing Cash App mm-hmm. and Twitter mm-hmm. has their own Cash App, he's CEO or on the board of two companies with the same thing. This yeah. similar thing happened with uh, Eric Schmidt, who was on the board famously of Apple, and then launched and bought Android and launched right. a competing product. And then and he was like step still down. on the board for a minute, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Steve Jobs was not pleased about it. Right. Um, all right. So there's your show for Wednesday. We got through it. Whew. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not easy to talk about these topics, but I want to be able to talk about the hardest topics possible. Thank you, Molly, for participating. Uh, yeah, it's not easy sometimes. Thank you, audience, for things. rolling with us. I mean, it is. Yeah. It, look, we're all real time processing together, and hopefully, we can yeah. extend each other that grace because we need to. We need to do it. Let's have the hard conversations. And mm-hmm. uh, I will. I didn't get to the uh, Palmer Lucky video, uh, but mm-hmm. I will. Mm-hmm. this is not like Jimmy Kimmel with Matt Damon saying we couldn't get to Matt Damon, but we'll get to him next show. <laughs> you know that bit he Isn't did forever. It? I know totally. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely not that. But tomorrow, I promise you, at the end of tomorrow. the show. I will happen. go over absolutely the Palmer Lucky saga, and that if, that that episode will be released on All In, and I will release the This Week in Startups tape here and get Molly's reaction to it. But you are, are you up on it? Did you read the? Uh, they made a little synopsis for us, so if you haven't read it, they'll give you the synopsis, which has like the timelines. I'm on it. Oh no, I'll be oh. I'll be up to date. Oh, just yes. want to make sure you're up to date while we don't you worry the context of what happened. I'm all about the prep. Yeah, it's good. It's gonna be a. It's gonna be. It's gonna be a dishy. Does she wait to come? Well, that's the big debate right now. Should all in release the oh. should all in release this with me having a comment at the end of it? Or should we release it here? Um mm-hmm. I don't feel comfortable releasing it without me giving some context because I don't think people understand what actually happened. Nick, do mm-hmm. you want to chime in on this? What you think is the best solution? Should Should a, third, I mean, should a neutral discuss- third party give the context? I don't know. Maybe? Uh, producer Nick, what were your, what, what are your yeah. thoughts on what, what the right way to do this is? Because I think it's a very exciting moment. I don't have a problem releasing the Palmer Lucky all in talk. Yeah, you got it. I, th- I think it's kind of like a really exciting moment. And I, th- I thought it was a really exciting resolution. And I, I kind of feel like maybe now Palmer and I, we're not besties, but I feel like maybe we could talk to each other. And that's a good thing. Um, he's doing important work in the world. Um, but what do you think, Nick, is the proper way for me to put context around this? Because there needs to be some context, because I don't know that people understand why I said the things I said. And we certainly didn't get there without spoiling the episode in our discussions. Yeah, I shared my thoughts yesterday with you guys, with the besties, obviously. Uh, so when when this was happening, I was up in the control room and I was like, my immediate thought was like, why would Jason say that? What? That What's such a terrible thing to say about someone? What was mm. happening at the time? That mm-hmm. why would he say something right. like that? Right, and right. he Palmer doesn't really explain the the scenario of what was going on. He says, you know, I donated to this Hillary thing, but in my head, I'm like, you know, you, I, as I know you, uh, the the one thing that's constant about you is supporting founders relentlessly. So I Absolutely. was, I had this crazy cognitive dis- dissonance, like, what? Like, was he just like a crazy person? Because that was obviously before I got to launch. I'm like, that sounds insane. Yeah, and then I, you know, after doing all the digging and the research and and hearing the context of what you said, it was I, I use the word uh, satisfying, not satisfying that you know obviously people could decide who's right and wrong in the situation, but satisfying in a sense that you're like, oh, he, okay, this makes yeah. a lot more sense now. Um, what I will say is th- the context some, makes sense. The to- mm-hmm. it, it, it mm-hmm. helps it so much, and I actually think it makes it an even better episode because you're it's almost like um like a Tarantino movie, like you get to the end and you're like, oh, here's actually how this all started. And it's, it's, it. a, it's a good kind of tie up for the whole thing. So let, the I, epi- let what happened at All In Summit play yep. out. And mm-hmm. then I come on and say, here's yep. the context. Here's the clip where I said what he quoted. Yeah. You can decide for yourself if he represented that properly. And here's what I was referring to. Exactly. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, objective bullet points from third party sources. Mm-hmm. Yep. Not in my opinion. So here is what third party sources said about the instance. And here is my words. Yeah. Unedited. Specifically, I mean, you'll see this in the clip. I, I, I don't think I'm really spoiling anything, but P- Palmer says in the thing something about you. He's like, you att- you said I don't care about my family or you attack my family. We, so that's a little bit of a mischaracterization of what you said. And I okay. mentioned in All In yesterday, I'm like, I don't, he could have just, that could have been an honest mistake out of rage or he could have been doing it on purpose. I don't know. But essentially uh so Evoking Ian Thompson, somebody's family is an intense thing to do right but he was like you like told you said i don't care about my family 
right? Right. I believe that's what he said. I, I have to double right. check. I, did, it was something I did not along say that. Lines. I said something completely different. The intent was And different. you not only said something different, you actually weren't, you were responding. So Ian Thompson was on the show from the Register, journalist. Great, awesome. He's he's a yeah, news round table guest a bunch of times. So yeah, on. we should have him back on. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. amazing. And he was saying, you know, he he makes a point right before you say that. He says Oculus just lost a ton of customers after the bot. It came out that he was like funding this uh, thing, yeah. hosting the bot farm, yeah, right or mm-hmm. whatever it was. And you then say, like this guy. Like, if you're in this position at this company, you need to, uh, you clearly don't care about your coworkers. You don't care about their families. You don't care. But you were responding to him saying yes. that they lost these customers, right? right. Meaning like, okay, they lose the customers and then maybe they get less funding. Maybe some yes. of them get fired. Get you got to think whatever. about the ramifications of your behavior because it wonder, doesn't affect just you. It affects also people's families. I right. wonder in a like producer brain, is it better to set that all up before you play the Palmer Lucky thing, because I worry that if you come out of it and it's you, that it might sound like a little bit of a rebuttal, especially like a defensive. Yeah, I mean, I think it'll be on you to make sure it doesn't sound defensive because it, you exactly had such correct. a nice moment on stage. Yeah. So I'm almost wondering that, just as yeah. an exercise, if that context is better set up at the beginning, like, hmm, hey, you're going to hear a lot in this interview before you go in or if that then predisposes it people to be biased against what he says of what happens and yeah. so i think it's almost I think like you have to do it after but you gotta like i almost wonder if someone else should set up the clips than you possible yeah or just I be mean, aware right be aware that you don't want to make it sound like was, now you're coming on and contradicting everything he said after you had that nice moment on stage. Here, here was my plan yeah um i obviously was taken back by what palmer did mm-hmm. and said um and i didn't remember exactly what i said but i do remember some of it so i went back and i thought it would be helpful for all of us as we resolve this issue and put it to bed Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to just hear exactly what i said and the context of it just so you know and i know that this could come across as defensive uh, but there there is context that's important here because people listening to this episode might not understand what he was talking about right totally uh and so since people might not understand it Here's just four basic facts of what I was responding to. And here's the unedited tape. You can decide for yourself. I know this might come across as defensive, but I would like actually to put this to bed for both of us and we can both move forward. Um, and here's just the extra context in case this was confusing. And again, yeah, I know it. this might come across as defensive, but I really am just presenting this in the spirit of putting a bow on this and giving everybody a tight resolution mm-hmm. to what occurred. And I wish Palmer Lucky all the success in the world. And to be fair, you were somewhat mischaracterized, which is also fine. But so. if I say that, <laughs> no, right, right, it looks right. like no. I'm like, I was mischaracterized and here's the transcript. And you can't will, say you were mischaracterized. They can, can go ahead and, they can go ahead and, you know, Chamath can be like, so no, you no, were the totally besties aren't going to be on it. They don't want to do it. Oh, they don't, they okay. don't want to come on with me for the rebuttal or the, I wouldn't even call it a rebuttal. I would say the explainer. It's they context. They don't want to come in yeah. for the explainer. The it's context. just context. It's just context, but I don't think it's So I think what you just said it is perfect. And by the way, the way Jason, I trust you to do this by yourself and make it unbiased because I've seen you do this before. You're good at that. Mm-hmm. You are. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, mean, I don't I'm think not, it's a problem. I, I, I never put out there that like in a 1400 episodes, this is going to be like a perfect, you know, tight, like, you know, review thing. It's a live show. Yep. I give my initial reaction. I, it's subject to change. Um, and obviously, I'm not right. I'm exploring topics like we did today. Today's show is a perfect example. We're yeah, exploring yeah. topics. For some people, it was too soon. For some people, it's just right. And we can we can disagree about that. And listen, if somebody pulls the tape from 20 years and or 200 years, yes, some things might seem I peculiar mean, or people's opinions might change over time. Wh- we have all... We, a, any one of us who has been broadcasting for the better part of our adult lives yeah. has pissed someone off. Uh, you think? Yeah. You know? Gotta, like, yeah, I mean, you got a list. You got a yeah. list. I mean, yeah. I trust, I also trust you to make it as, uh, the way you just said it is perfect. I totally agree. And I can't believe those yeah. weenies aren't going to come on with you. <laughs> well, I think for them, like, they don't want to. I'm like, Team Jason. Well, no, they, they were Team Jason, uh, you know, in fairness. Uh, no, they were you great. Know, you'll, you'll hear that. They were, they were they really much, very much came to my defense, which was great. Yep. Um, unnecessary, but delightful yep. um, and fair, I think. They were fair about it, um, especially Freeberg, which I think people were kind of taken back that he had that, like, really emotional. high level of emotional mm-hmm. intelligence. But, you know, Freeberg also is, um, his point of doing the podcast, he said this many times on the air, is he wants people to be able to have hard discussions 
uh, and think from first principles and move forward as a society. So he mm -hmm. felt like that was the ultimate uh, example of that, of people yeah. with differences, you know, agreeing on something that's more important than their differences, like our differences over Hillary posting and Trump are not as important as protecting Taiwan, or Ukraine, mm -hmm. or the country from all kinds of terrorist and other right. attacks or children. Uh, yeah, or children, right? Like, so the person has, you know, I, I believe this bomber lucky is obviously absurdly talented. P perhaps he's a savant a genius level talent. I don't know as an entrepreneur, I mean, Oculus and then Andrew, I mean, this is not a coincidence that he's able to do what he does. Mm -hmm. um, he's obviously super talented. So in a way, it's more important for society for the two of us to kind of be able to look at all the good things he's doing. And yeah, if there's things we disagree about, we can disagree about them. But hey, man, we need to move on and solve big, real problems in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was always my intent. Anyway, great show, everybody. Wait, before uh, you go, I have, one, I have one short thing to say that I thought uh -oh. was the most amazing thing from it. So obviously, Palmer going up there, as you said before, it, it took some guts to do that at Cajones. your house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Some stones from that guy. And then it was funny. There was a lot of murmuring going on. While everyone was like, "Oh my God, is Jason going to come out? Is Jason? Is he okay? Do we need to get this guy off the stage? All this are nonsense, his, right? Are his and brothers like, going to kill Palmer Lucky right now? I, yeah, yeah. I'm like, is my dad going to get a murder charge? Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, can we call the mayor? Make sure the mayor's on speed by in case anyone gets arrested. No, but I'm like, yeah. I, I was like, I think I told my dad, like, take it easy, cowboy. Like, he doesn't need to go off. The He's fine. And there was someone next to me, and and they were uh, like, oh my God, what's going on? And I'm like, I guarantee you, I pro I would bet my life, Jason is going to be the first person out the door on that stage. Because they're like, I don't know if he's going to come out. What's going to happen? I'm like, I guarantee you, he's the first one out on the stage. <laughs> oh, I couldn't and wait course, to get out you there. Go, you go right next to him. I was yeah. like Mike Tyson getting <laughs> yes, in the ring. Yeah. I was like, let's go. You're like, I was like, oh, but not, you weren't looking to fight. You were mm -hmm. like, okay, let's talk about this. Like, I yeah. clearly said some things and you felt this way about yeah. it. And let's have a discussion. And it was amazing. Yeah. That is my, uh, for me, when I say like Mike Tyson, or Conor McGregor, like being in that debate is something I would absolutely cherish and look forward to. I mean, I wish that I had a, a moment like that every year where somebody disagreed with me and we could just, you know, really uh, go at it and, and debate it. You know, like I invited the people from XRP on the pod, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Brad, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have known him and I see him socially sometimes, but he doesn't want to come on the pod. And I want to have that debate. Is XRP a security or not? Some people just don't want to come on and, and have a debate about stuff. And I kind yeah. of feel like it's, uh, you know, it's a missed opportunity. You know, it's a missed opportunity. I like that we had a little debate today um, and, mm -hmm. you know, a deep, important discussion. To me, the rest of my day is I'm going to have more energy. Yeah. I'm going to be more intellectually stimulated. Yeah. You know, like this, this Good, is a great. you got a couple of to do. Oh, no. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, go with the ad reads. <laughs> oh, God, this show is so successful. Uh, got to raise the price of the ads. <laughs> The ads are too cheap. <laughs> they just keep selling out. Keep adding days of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, We're blessed. Right. We're, We're blessed. blessed. We're blessed. We got uh, you know what? And the partners—they're just—they're great partners. I enjoy reading the ads.